Hi, I'm Taylor Owen, host of the Big Tech Podcast. In this week's episode, I spoke with Joan Donovan about the Stop the Steal campaign, the attack on Capitol Hill, and what it tells us about our media ecosystem and how to govern it. Joan and I had a great conversation, and I wanted to share the full, unedited version of our interview with you here. If you want to listen to the podcast version in your favorite podcasting app, you can find a link in the description. Thank you so much for doing this. Um, looking at all the craziness um, and actual tragedy that's happened over the past week, but certainly months before that, there's a uh, few people in the world I'd rather talk to it about than you. So I really appreciate you doing this. You're in high demand and I appreciate you taking some time. I am, but you know, <laughs> it's like, uh, it's like any other field, um, you know, I just, I, I don't ever want to be caught doing research that isn't impactful. Um, but one day I will uh, retire and write the technology book about Stephen King that, <laughs> that has been, you know, sitting at the back of my mind <laughs> since I was a teenager. <laughs> but for now, um, your work on impact means sort of embedding yourself in a, a conversation and a media ecosystem that is toxic and dangerous and I can imagine just hard to spend this much time in um, how are you doing broadly are you I, doing okay? I'm hanging in there you know my team are uh some of the best in the world and I say that not just because they bring a sense of rigor and complexity to the problem of disinformation media manipulation mm -hmm. and online extremism but also because like me they're continuously going to find the bright side, even if it's fairly dark humor. Um, <laughs> we do, you know, stay up very late chatting with each other, sharing memes, trying to understand all of the things going on. But, um, you know, I, I hire people who are purpose driven. Uh, mm -hmm. I hire people that care more about the problem than they care about their, you know, resume. Yeah. Uh, and they're intensely collaborative in that sense. And so I, I have a lot of support. And um, and then, you know, it's been very interesting doing this work at Harvard Kennedy School where um, we have some of the most, uh, well, I'd say some of the most interesting people who work on policy <laughs> and some of the smarter ones. <laughs> so, um, you know, and so it, I saw it's someone <laughs> just lost their advisory position this morning. So oh, goodness. Maybe goodness, put goodness. her in the interesting category. But, yeah, exactly. Yeah, and so a side track. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's it's hard, you know, yeah. um, uh, but from the vantage point of where we are and, and what kind of resources we need to have, you know, having people like Seti Warren, who's the executive director, who also worked uh, under uh, Obama and with with Kerry, and then Nancy mm -hmm. Gibbs, who is the editor uh, in chief of Time Magazine, right? It's like uh, mm -hmm. nowhere else would I have the support of people who had um, seen and done uh, some of the most important uh, policy work as well as uh, journalism. And so, yeah, yeah, so it's, it's, it's definitely, um, it's a position of privilege that I take, yeah. you know, take very seriously. Um, but yeah, it's, it, so it's, it's weird to be in the moment doing the research that everybody's looking for and, uh, having a community of scholars around me that, uh, that just get it. They yeah. just get it. I mean, they, they do, but it's interesting how much of that community whether it's the policy community or even much of the research community actually didn't see this coming in the same way um, or dismissed it as something that it it clearly wasn't right and and yeah. you you did see it I mean just mm -hmm. last week you right before the insurgency you tweeted protest as a crucible today we will witness the full break of the MAGA movement from representative politics so I I wonder if we could start by just you talking a bit about how you knew this was going to erupt in the way it did and where does that knowledge come from and how, how what did you watch over the past few months that made you really know what was going to happen here mm -hmm. you know so uh for the last decade i've uh studied 
social movements. And if you study social movements, you you can kind of tell three to six months into the future, what are the possible potential outcomes if movements uh, continue in the way that they have been behaving. Yeah. So we were in the thick of it, especially me and my um, co-authors on the Guardian uh, op-ed uh, from, from uh, this week, um, Brian Friedberg and Emily Dreyfus really just paying a lot of attention to when this MAGA movement was innovating. So mm -hmm. as Stop the Steal started to coalesce into a street movement, had rallies, uh, was bringing together people like Ali Alexander with Alex Jones, with Nick Fuentes, if people don't know him, he's a sort of an heir to the alt-right of Richard mm -hmm. Spencer. He's, he's an online streamer. Um, as these influencers started to show up in public space, they started to show up at Capitol buildings and mm. they were showing up at state legislatures. Uh, this is happening in tandem with uh, the carnival uh, that Rudy Giuliani had put on display of uh, continuous performative litigation. So you so have this a is an movement. In the moment immediately after the, I mean, within the weeks yeah. after the election. The weeks right? after the election, but you yeah. have to understand that all of this is really about media manipulation. It's about creating the conditions by which people feel as if, if they don't do something, nothing will change, right? Mm -hmm. So movements, the most important moment in a movement is when they feel that there is nothing left to do institutionally there is no avenue forward by which they can win and the only other option is chaos and violence hmm. and uh when movements reach those that level of desperation uh it can happen in two ways one is that's very true and uh, uh calls for accountability thinking here about Black Lives Matter and all of the different ways in which uh, activists have tried to make police accountable uh, for years in LA. I was part of the Black Lives Matter movement of activists in LA who mm. would wake up at 6 a.m. every Tuesday to go and hold police accountability, uh, you know, testimony at the police oversight committee, you know, just time and time again, mm. trying to push the institutional levers. And when all of that fails, movements become very uh, chaotic because it's very hard to harness that kind of uh, despair and grief. Mm. The second way it can happen, though, is exactly the way that we saw, which is through disinformation. Mm. And if you can create the appearance that all avenues have been litigated and exhausted. Right, because that never happened, right? Like the election was an <laughs> institutional pathway that exactly but you, if you have 60 court cases where people online are saying every day uh they're trying and trump is being thwarted and mm -hmm. then and then you layer in uh the chaos of someone like lynn wood and sydney powell who mm -hmm. you, you know uses memetics like release the kraken to make people think that there's something more behind this what did that mean? Can you explain what you meant by memetics? Oh, so the that? release the Kraken was basically the onslaught or the torrent of litigation against uh, all of th these different um, mm -hmm. states to prove that there was election fraud. And so this mm -hmm. the Kraken is this kind of like, uh, you know, many armed octopus that's like reaching out, trying to grab hold of uh the legal institution to overturn the election right and mm -hmm. and so that imagery this notion of seizure this like we tried the institutional way and it didn't work mm. you know we see that get performed by trump on january 6th as he gives a, a very boring speech mm. to people going over and saying you know this amount of people in this state and this thing over here and we mm. tried and we tried that's just a reflection of the media that people had been consuming online that felt as if it was, you know, uh, that the election was being stolen from this man who uh, represented them. He's literally the embodiment of them and their beliefs. And well, figuratively, if, maybe not probably not. Literally. Well, I don't know. I, you know, he's he's very much uh, a vessel. 
yeah. for a lot of these people if we're we're talking in in sort of biblical yeah. uh layers but it but this movement talks like that right yeah. um yeah of course but yeah so as i was watching all of those street protests and i was watching what was playing out online around stop the steal it became very apparent to me that they were done you know messing with mitch mcconnell and and hoping mm. that ted cruz would save the day and those that went to the Capitol were very clear that they were going there to save Trump. And mm. based upon the tactics of the past, where they were trying to disrupt the certification of electors, were trying to disrupt the vote, uh, it was just very obvious to me amongst, you know, and other researchers that mm. something was going to go down at the Capitol. The other thing that happens in the moment that I, I don't know if we're ever going to have any like deep empirical knowledge about, but I've I've watched enough live streams of this moment to know that the moment that Trump is speaking, Pence issues a letter saying that he is not going to overturn the election and that he will be certifying the votes. Mm. And people who are watching Trump are getting this information in their phones and that is that is such an important moment because it starts to spread like a rumor through the crowd hmm. uh, that the Pence option, which they had been talking about, isn't going to happen. Right. Um, and you had people who were which you know, crystallizes the alternative, right? Exactly. That, like, exactly. Desperation. Yeah. yeah and, and it's been interesting <laughs> to see the fallout from that because of, uh, you know, Alex Jones has not been a vocal supporter of QAnon. It's it's kind hmm. of a, a competing uh, mm. framework for understanding this moment than mm. than his own, and so for for Alex Jones, the reaction to the insurrection has been one largely of, hey, listen, it didn't matter like what Pence was going to do, like they were going to call for this ten day stay, and there was going to be more investigation, and you ruined everything, right? And now that we're into the mm. optics debate, um that's that's an important feature as well of movements but that moment when pence issues that letter and that and people are trying to think through well what is left and they're also many of them aren't at home they're in dc which mm. is probably one of the most cinematic places to be mm. um you know and and so the moment was really ripe for uh the culture and the politic and the social uh, you know, to to really combine in mm. a way. And then there were some people who were ready for this. They knew that the density yeah. of bodies in space was going to provide an opportunity for uh, frenzy. Yeah. So one of the ways you research this and the way you describe these phenomena is through life cycles of media manipulation, and which I think is really important because it treats the ecosystem as the diverse place that it is and some of the intention and puts focus on some of the intentionality behind the actors involved and how they use these media. Do, does that framing fit the stop the steal campaign broadly defined? And can you sort of maybe if it does, can you like maybe walk through a little bit what these phases are and how they played out in this case, where and how yeah. they played out? Yeah. So, uh, yeah, we use this life cycle model and it's available, uh, all of our research, we've been trying to keep most of it as, as open access as possible. So it's on mediamanipulation.org. but mm. the model's fairly simple. It says that there's going to be a moment where there's an opportunity and campaigns will be, uh, conceptualized, right. And that people will start to plan them. And then the second phase is when they start to, seed that campaign across webs and social so it could have it could begin in a chat room it could begin on a message board it could begin in a uh you know a, an office park in saint petersburg right there's mm -hmm. a kind of conceptualization process that says this is the opportunity and then you start to see the content start to get it start to be layered online in different forums and and ways and then crucially is who responds so we have mm. so many models of disinformation campaigns that get littered on the internet and then nothing happens and yeah. so importantly for journalists they have to realize that in stage three if they choose to respond to something they may actually trigger uh more attention and more amplification of that yeah. and so for years researcher in our field is really focused on the role that journalists 
journalists play in amplifying disinformation. The fourth stage um, for the first uh, couple of years of doing this research was was relatively uh, absent, which is mitigation, like not just platform companies refusing to take action, but it was really hard to get people to call things disinformation or misinformation. I'm thinking here particularly about the use of Facebook to spread Holocaust denial. Mm. Uh, a couple of years ago, Zuckerberg came out and said, hey, listen, I know the Holocaust happened, but if somebody else doesn't know, that might just be a mistake and mm. we shouldn't take that down. Um, and so, you know, mitigation is something that we look very closely at because mitigation actually determines how manipulators adapt and change their targets. Uh, right. and, change and Zuckerberg, their of course, changed that policy. So he did. He, he, he ended, did eventually. But tells us many things about the whole system. But <laughs> we can get into that later. But, yeah, but no, it also a creates a different of... mitigation strategy, like a different strategy by people who wanted to deny the Holocaust, right? All of a sudden. Yeah, exactly. Like he, he really it. couldn't understand the fact that people in mass, in groups, use that belief to mobilize each other and hmm. to and to bring uh, more and different and more toxic Holocaust denial into the world, right? It was, mm. you know, not to get too sociological, but it's about the replication of these worldviews and these ideas mm. uh, that that social media companies fail to understand is how important their technology is in that repetition and replication. Right. Uh, but when it comes to stop the steal, it was pretty clear over the past few months that Trump was going to by any means necessary, uh, claim that the election was being stolen and or rigged. Mm. His first line of attack, of course, was against mail-in ballots and this notion that they're just giving away ballots and they're being shredded and they're being filled out by, you know, communists and, you know, and like there was just all kinds of rhetoric about the mail-in ballots. But Stop the Steal as a campaign had been online prior to that. Uh, Roger Stone had registered the domain and had, mm. you know, for 2016, anticipating a Trump loss and a big um, moment to try to mobilize these MAGA folks uh, into uh, this position that Trump had been um, somehow robbed of, of the election. Mm. So the, the groundwork for Stop the Steal actually existed or, the, you know, prior to November 3rd. But November mm. 3rd, you start to see a constellation of folks come together around Stop the Steal. And the group starts growing so fast on Facebook that Facebook eventually shuts it down. There were through 330,000 people when I checked in on it. I saw that uh, it was 100 Facebook new signups every 10 seconds yeah there's a great report that came out very recently but the do you remember the name of the lab yeah I'm ryerson blanking. okay right? yeah yeah exactly. yeah anatoly's lab i saw a piece on it this morning actually yeah, yeah so that kind of spread is is digitally enabled by the algorithmic recommendation systems as well as these networks that um were uh facebook had tried to uh um remove which were these QAnon networks that had figured out how to quote unquote go camo as they called it and hmm. and contain and, and and ingratiate themselves in other spaces on on Facebook which is like uh I keep joking that Donovan's first law of disinformation is that uh, uh if you leave disinformation to fester long enough it'll infect the whole product right mm -hmm. and so the right. QAnon's a good example of that mm -hmm. which is Stop the steal then is is being uh, you know pushed across all of these different networks, and then the the mitigation strategy, of course, by Facebook was to try to stop them from joining a very large group, which forced this network distributed model of local stop the steal groups to happen. Um, but through it all, uh, not only is uh, these companies trying to mitigate it, but then you have politicians stepping in saying, um, utilizing that response uh, as a tool to make people think that they're being silenced and suppressed mm. in some way. Mm. And that uh, this forces these groups to 
move into other spaces, most particularly Gab and Parlor. But it's not the case that they're just using Gab and Parlor. I want to dispense with this idea that somehow they move off of Twitter yeah. and Facebook and like are just siloed. Right, which That's is the idea that one happens. QAnon ban moves an entire community off Facebook. Exactly, which exactly. Didn't happen, it doesn't. Right? It like doesn't happen that way, and yeah. we have to, we have to not get caught up in the corporate logic of the walled gardens here. We have to realize yeah. that people are mul uh, people use multiple platforms at the same time, hmm. and so as this was happening, um, you know, we were very attentive to like which politicians and whatnot were were pushing this and and how it was going to grow mm. and uh and so yeah as we were thinking about this and trying and, and we've been writing it up it's just uh it, it it's looking as if it's the biggest disinformation campaign uh that we've seen uh through through the internet um mm. and, like i i can't think of anything bigger, right? I can think of things that are definitely disinformation that have happened in the past, like, uh, like the, the idea that, uh, uh, Saddam Hussein had a nuclear weapons, mm. right? That was a kind of lie that was told mm. to justify, uh, mm. intervention, but, uh, this one is very different because it's using the logics, uh, and the, appearance or of protest to serve Donald Trump, who's the sitting president. He's not a challenger. And so in mm. that way, he's not an average citizen and he's not um, someone that's being, you know, just having his accounts taken away from him. Like yeah. if this was the president of another country and that was doing this kind of um, media manipulation, you know, the, the UN might step in. Right. So, so you mentioned the media framing here and the role that amplification plays in the media. Um, a, a couple of years ago in the lead up to the Canadian election, you were kind enough to join us for a training session we were doing for Canadian journalists on how they should cover or not cover disinformation in the election. And I remember you, um, <laughs> saying in response to a question that, well, maybe you just shouldn't cover it, right? Maybe this stuff just shouldn't be talked about, which is almost common knowledge now in the research community around this stuff. But in a room full of journalists, it, it, it doesn't go over well, right? This like challenges their core value proposition and sense of identity, which is we mm -hmm. reveal, uncover truths so that they can be given the light of day, right? That is, mm -hmm. that is the accountability function of journalism. Um, in many people's minds. Um, so how, how do you look back at the way the media played a role in this or not in, in this episode? And does the, the presence of a parallel media ecosystem like Fox and others really totally distort that calculus, right? So it's not just about CNN covering this or the New York Times covering it and amplifying it, but you actually have this other thing that functions yeah, entirely it, differently. No, that's, and that's very true. So when I give that kind of advice about think twice about coverage, I'm, I'm very specifically talking about extremists and white supremacists. So the Proud Boys contingent of the MAGA coalition is a really important example here, which is to say that uh, there are different ways of covering them. And so Dana Board and I have written about this notion of strategic silence, which is important in the mm. sense that it's strategic, which is to say that you cover things using your perspective, your words, bringing into the fray um, people who are impacted by white supremacist violence and, and rallies, but don't uncritically hand the microphone over and say, well, tell me what, what bothered you as a child that right. left you open to these ideas and made you mm. think that you're superior. Because they're going to start from the very get by saying, everybody says we're a white supremacist organization, and but we're really, yeah. we're not. Yeah. We're just, you know, we're just guys who like to drink and like, you know, like our women in the kitchen and like, don't think immigrants should come. Yeah, You know, like what's wrong with that, right? And it just gives a whole different platform to their ideas. And yeah. so the, the role here is about 
understanding within the media uh, manipulation life cycle where you are. Hmm. And if you're in a position where they're trying to get journalists to pay attention to you, uh, to, to, to them, uh, you can do much more damage by saying, oh, they're going to have a rocky armed protest at the Capitol. Sure would be a shame if you went, right? Which is what's mm. happening right now is you have extremists mm. trying to uh, get journalists to cover their different protests. And, you know, some of them are, are six guys in Idaho at the Capitol, like looking around, you know, being like, mm. well, if we can get media coverage, maybe we can get the groundswell of support. And so, well, and with the, ban with the banning, count bannings, it's harder for them to use social platforms to serve that sort of self-gathering function, right? Yeah, which is exactly why journalists need to be wary, because mm. a lot of times they come with an offer to journalists. They'll say, I'm going to, I'm going to spill the tea on this guy. That's a real white supremacist. Mm. They'll come with a scoop. Um, and this is what we saw with how Richard Spencer and Milo Yiannopoulos cultivated journalists. They made journalists think they were the only ones they were given this information to. Right. And journalists uh, often, I, I think, you know, most people don't understand the relationship between a journalist in their sources, hmm. but they cultivate personal relationships with these with these sources. And so we saw time and time again, the, the so-called alt-right was able to trigger coverage by journalists by planting stories and by making journalists think that um, that they were more effective than they really were. Or and that they had pri access, privileged access. Privileged access, Dude, yeah. and they were also yeah. trying to sell out uh, their like a competition in terms of like social media clout yeah, and yeah. Uh, leaking, you know, phone calls and whatnot. Yeah. And so we, when I talk about don't cover these things or be careful with your coverage of these things, it's really because journalists want to take, and rightfully like researchers, they want to be objective and they want to take a view from nowhere. And we have to actually approach this now entirely the opposite by saying we have power and the things we call attention to matter. Mm. And therefore, when we cover these things, we have a duty of care to our audiences in providing the kind of context and expl explanation. I mean, mm. I'm giving this advice to journalists in the midst of their editors saying, you can't use the term white supremacist. Right. You can't mention white nationalism. Even in the AP guidelines, things start to shift yeah. around calling people the alt-right. So when when we're discussing this, it's really about this moment in journalism where there's a there's a battle between editors and shot callers that are mate that are asking journalists to tell these stories, and then journalists who are really um, uh, caught off guard by the tactics that these groups are using in order to mm. get attention. And so uh, that's why it's important that we understand this relationship. Now, what happens when Trump gets involved, though, is a mm. completely different order of magnitude, because yeah. by virtue of being the U.S. president, he sits at the center of not just media in the U.S., but international media. Mm. And so you can't ignore that but you surely have to not play into what him and Giuliani and Steve Bannon and others had really tried to organize, which was a mass disinformation campaign um, first against mail-in voting. Then they tried to, then they tried to plant the Biden laptop story and, mm. and New York times and wall street journal and other Washington post decided they were not going to cover it in the yeah. way that Trump media was trying to position it. And then we get this uh, iteration of, of Stop the Steal that uh, really just gets wild uh, the closer yeah. you look at it. So that's an interesting way of framing it as this almost slow build of this big lie, right? They knew this, they needed that trigger of a, of a, a big, a significant wrong that could mobilize. But, and they tried all these strategies to mm -hmm. like, let that take hold. Um, the platforms responded at the very end of that process by cutting mm -hmm. off access. Um, so do, was that the right time to do it for them? Or where do you stand on that debate about when the platform should have cut off accounts? 
I think we needed a set of rules that we never got um, related to platforms and the responsibility of politicians. We have different different users provide different uses of the mm. same technology, which is to say that yeah. our research takes an infrastructural approach to this infrastructure, according to Susan Lee Starr, Martha Lamplin, Jeff Bowker, uh, it is a three-part concept. There's the technology, which is the hardware, the sockets, uh, the electricity, you know, mm. the the software, all of that. Then there's uh, the protocols and the rules, uh, the terms of service, the the you know the rules of your ISP, the rules of your your content hosting mm. services, your domain services. There are all kinds of rules about being online. Yeah. Uh, and then the rules, of course, of platform companies, which exist but are not implemented. Mm. And then you have the people. And the users are such an interesting phenomenon to think with related to how they change our understanding of infrastructure, which is to say that if your social media use is uh, largely political, you are a politician, uh, you use social media strategically for political wins. If you're a marketer, though, and your goal is to make money, then the strategic use of social media is about incentivizing people to buy your product. Mm. Um, if you're a researcher and you're using social media, uh, the, 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 the goal is to get people on social media to read your research, right? Yeah. So different users have different use cases and also then have different incentives for using social media. And bending it to their will then has a lot to do with how flexible the rules are, which is to say that people see technology as something that's uniform and therefore everybody should be able to use it. But Facebook did a very particular thing, which is they created a carve out for politicians that said that they were not gonna apply the rules to politicians and that they wanted people to see politicians for who they were, quote unquote, warts and all. And this, I think, was a strategically bad decision because mm -hmm. what they failed to account for more so that someone has political power is that they also have network power, right? So Manuel yeah. Castells talks about this yeah. among others, which is when you have power in a network, um, you can, you can direct people to do different things. You can organize large-scale protests, um, which has been a virtue for many about the internet is that, you know, relatively anonymous individuals can use uh, the internet and technology and infrastructure in order to uh, coordinate, organize, and plan mm. large-scale social movements. And yeah. we've rewarded that use case uh with lots of praise over the years and everything from occupy to black lives matter to standing rock um yeah you know it's been it's been immensely transformative but in the wrong hands mm. uh for the wrong ends it's a different technology entirely it's a different infrastructure yeah and so when trump turns to social media at the beginning of his, uh, you know, career as a as a mediated politician, he doubles down on conspiracism. Mm. He begins, you know, with this idea that Obama wasn't really born in the United States, yeah. uh, and he failed to become president and in a couple of different uh, moments before he was able to. Um, come up with a strategy using with Bannon uh, of how to use data and messaging and uh, this sort and of media dogged. Yeah. 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 And so, you know, as I think about it and I look back on it, it's just, yeah, he's a completely mediated president in that sense. And yeah. without social media though, it's going to be really hard for him to reconstitute and whip up the fervor of uh, his most loyal supporters because mm. uh, ultimately he's not gonna be able to reach a hundred million people instantaneously yeah. after, you know, this week. That, I, it seemed like Twitter in their post about the ultimate account ban 
signaled that intentionality of users. And they said, look, we're not just looking at what he said. We're looking at how, what, how he wanted it to be interpreted and how it was received and interpreted by others. Is, mm -hmm. is that a move in the direction you're talking about? Where when we look at speech, we need to look at... Yeah, we have to look at the context and the consequence. Uh, yeah. This is, you know, the rubric of incitement is important here, which is that in the midst of the the siege on the Capitol, where you you have people who are not just, I mean, we focus on death, but how many people were injured? Mm. How many how many reporters were were punched and kicked and dragged to the ground? How many? uh people were injured uh you know in that moment how you know how how is our government going to come together across party lines ever again knowing that uh republicans were in favor of not certifying the electors right like these yeah. are existential questions but the damage that they cause stems from that moment that I described earlier, which is that Trump was airing the grievances and then had told people they had no not, no other option than to make the Capitol hear them. Um, and then in the middle of all of that, he's sending messages that are essentially like, hey guys, listen, the, the election was totally stolen. Uh, that is true. Yeah. And what you're doing is is important but also go go home now right that's like uh i mean i've seen more harsher uh closures of of punk shows <laughs> you know like it's not just hey fellas you got to get out of here right it's like, yeah. it's like oh i've called the national guard yeah and you're all gonna go to jail if you don't go home yeah. Right. That's not what he was doing there. He oh. was basically saying in a very weak willed and for an audience that it's already primed for hearing uh, something other than what is said yeah. uh, or reading the subtext. Uh, I think they understood the subtext completely. Um, yeah. It was that the, the, there was no discussion about peace to be had without a mm. discussion about accountability and ramifications of not going away right and and many of these people thought one they were going to win and that trump was going to pardon them while he executed pence right um that like you know i i know it just sounds so crazy to it, say it, it out I know, loud right it's just incredible yeah and and but it's like as as we're watching this happen as as you go back and you look at all the videos and all the testimony and all the like mm. background fodder which the platforms are struggling to delete right now and to be honest with you it's like uh uh this is creating like mass chaos in the research community because people are you know doing everything they can to collect yeah data i mean we're losing a record of all this right yeah it's a record but also like we should have again another failure to, to create policy there should be a human rights locker right uh that says that we're moving this out of search and recommendation uh mm -hmm. but we are preserving it for yeah. history and we're going to provide the the infrastructure for for analysis so mm. that um not just you know history i mean this is law enforcement i mean this right. is like yeah, like the course. cops are in the same mess that we are uh, as researchers where they're trying to gather this information and this intelligence so that they can uh not not look so um like i mean heinously heinously yeah. under staffed and underprepared yeah so i i think the the focus on trump accounts and and the takedown of the most egregious content ends up being pretty distraction distracting in a lot of this conversation um some of this stuff is clearly illegal it should be taken down there's not a lot of debate about that it's about capacity and scale and ability to do it um the far bigger problem, as he alluded to, is the 99% of harmful but not illegal content that ends up creating that network effect that causes harm. Um, how do you think the platforms are dealing with that right now? And where do you feel you, their approach is, is, going, is going wrong here? Because they're clearly not 
managing it effectively, but. Yeah. I mean, I, I hesitate to give any free consulting these days, <laughs> you know, like I, I, you know, my, my attention is much more on what everybody else can do. Yeah. Which is to say that community uh, based organizations, civil society organizations, now is the time for uh, you know, and I saw your collaborator, Robert Gore was uh, policy, what is it the policy research network, something like that? Platform it's, governance research. Network. Platform yeah. governance <laughs> research policy yeah. network, extraordinary uh, <laughs> adventure in bureaucracy, uh, adventures in bureaucracy network, right? Um, not New to, brand. You know, it, but it's just, it, but I look at stuff like that and I say, yeah, now's the time for a strong uh, academic, uh, and scientifically informed, empirical look at where we went wrong and what other yeah. levers of power need to be brought in uh, to correct for just the enormous power that these companies have been able to have by virtue, at least in the United States, of Section 230, mm. you know, Section 230 is largely a policy of decontrol. It, it says there's going to be this industry. We want to open it up and re reduce impediment to innovation by saying we're going to get rid of liability for uh, these companies. And in many ways, it creates path dependence mm. for these companies who then see content and the generation of content uh, as um, a way to bring networks together, which is what they then monetize, which is the right. network ties between people. Yeah. And so I don't see a world in which we don't look at those network ties and the money that is generated off of them, uh, off of the data that they generate, off of the side markets around advertising and say, okay, if your platform serves 500,000 people, you need a policy about content moderation that uh, ensures that, you know, incitement, harassment, hate, pornography, mm. uh, these things do not, uh, these things are not going to be profitable. And include and include disinformation in that, especially as a carve out for politicians uh, who will have to have different rules of engagement on these platforms going forward. Yeah. Um, which is to say, like I, I'm disappointed, like everybody, that you know Napster doesn't exist anymore. I, you know, still got a lot of those MP3s, <laughs> and any any yeah. lawyer wants to come for me, you can come for me, but. Uh, none of them are Metallica. I can promise you that. <laughs> I like I like some hard rock, but um, I, I bring that up to say that we've been here before. We've had right. These technologies. Come and they yep. come and go, and we shouldn't mm. be so fixated on a future with Facebook yeah. um, that we we are afraid to create uh, the rules we need to rein in power yeah. and money and, and fetishizing their power just further entrenches. Exactly. The status exactly. quo, right? Yeah. yeah. No, and so I think that the the uh, platform governance research network does need to go international, does need to bring in as many points of view as possible, and I think also looking towards some of the amazing uh, journalist protection organizations yeah. that have been thinking about uh, journalism online and distribution, looking to um places like uh, i'm a board member here but at free press uh mm. looking at like what what they recommend around hate and incitement with the change the terms coalition yeah. and really getting at policy that comes from the people yeah uh, comes from people who have been in this who've been victims of massive harassment campaigns mm. and daniel citron and marion frank's work on yeah um, you know, hate crimes and high and cyberspace and their, mm. their, uh, digital rights initiatives. Like, you know, like there's just so much work to be done that can create model policy and move us mm. that much closer to, uh, the web we want. What we you, shouldn't just do. And this yeah. is, this has driven me crazy is our research field has been 
just tore up and solely fixated on grasping the scraps of data that mm. platform companies are willing to dole out. And if you look at the quality of the research that comes out from these groups that are mm. carrying water for these platform companies, they don't include a critique of the design. They don't include a critique of the power invested in these platform companies uh, because they can't imagine a methodology that uh, moves us away from this data centric model and, and gets us into a place where our field yeah. is working with data that has got has been gotten uh, ethically and openly so that it can be audited. But our fields, you know, for 2016, 2017 was just uh, overrun with claims that if we just got the data, somehow we would know something so mm -hmm. precious and so yeah. like turn the curve on disinformation that we would have yeah. solutions. And it just doesn't, it doesn't work like that. And so right. it's been hard for me to even say that publicly because um, I'm friends with some of these Yeah, people. these are colleagues and friends. I, I agree. I sit in yeah. all these different worlds and it's... Uh... But it just it just the disciplinary shows us. drive of scholarship is just so strong, you know, and the, yeah. the 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 idea that one's methods are sacrosanct is uh, is a real problem. Yeah, and particularly no, and when the that, underlying data, as you say, is so bad. Like that's the thing. Mm -hmm. Like surprise, surprise, the data being provided shows a certain thing. I mean, mm -hmm. it's yeah. why we've led to the we've gotten to this place of public knowledge and what mm -hmm. assumption about how these systems work. Yeah, no, and I think that that, you know, um, a colleague of mine from UCLA, I think he's at Queens University now, uh, Mike Ciliano, writes about technology having this kind of enchanting effect. It's cool. Mm. Um, you yeah. know, and, and as a result of it being cool, we look at these people inside these tech companies as having some kind of uh precious view from the inside mm. uh and that the data that they could open up to us somehow and, and hold some kind of mystical key to society yeah. and as a sociologist of course uh you know we're trained to to spot you know the the mysticism in numbers right like right. the kind of like way in which people obfuscate by saying more is better Whereas like in science studies, we talk about more is different. Uh, it's different just like in physics in the sense that uh, once you start looking at more data, uh, different kinds of questions, uh, of course, come up, mm. but it can also obfuscate what's plainly in view, yeah. which is that, uh, you know, that we have a problem with white supremacy in the United States and technology amplifies and exacerbates this by virtue of the features that it, mm. it emboldens, which is like connection and organization. Yeah. And, and so, rec um, rec and, and taking uh, what are inorganic processes and making them seem perfectly oh, natural, yeah. right? Like QAnon was not an organically driven thing. People didn't just were naturally gravitated to this, these set of ideas. They were created. Yeah. Yeah. And in that sense, it's like it tugged on a lot of uh, conspiracies of the past uh, w while also pegging the day-to-day -day discussion to the news, right? Mm. And so a moment like Epstein's arrest, which feels like ages ago, right? Mm. In that world was so monumental, so much proof of everything they had imagined was possible around this, uh, this trope that they had been like stuck on, which is this idea that Democrats and politicians internationally were abusing children right and and that was the animating feature of of pizzagate as well which led to an extremist uh man showing up to um comet ping pong with a with a rifle and yep. and discharging it right and and so but it doesn't describe and this is the thing that we we lose here is 
you know, the thousands of people who showed up there uh, that weren't that man with the gun to take pictures and to take selfies of themselves and to become part of the story. And I think, yeah, like his, you know, Chris Kelty's work at UCLA on participatory networks and like the notion of participation, that's really what's uh, bringing these groups together is like participating in this, this online discussion Mm. uh, in like that, that tie between the wires and the weeds of like what's happening online refract refracting with what's happening in offline. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I don't know what your thoughts are not to like totally do this, but I'd love to do this to you. (laughs) Uh, Like, what do you think about Facebook saying, uh, you know, we're acting on real world harms, like this notion that somehow Mm. the internet uh, in, in what happens on Facebook isn't real world. Like that to me was all, you know, I always, I read these policies for the, the sort of cultural implications of what, Hmm. what they're saying and what the, um, what, you know, version of the world they're, they're trying to, to model. And yeah, I just would love to know from your perspective, what, what's even there yeah likewise i mean they just want to have so many different versions of this reality at the same time right i mean for years they had been pushing back against the idea of digital dualisms and <laughs> all these things that right people who didn't understand the internet at the time were saying and now all of a sudden mm-hmm. they're falling right back back on it right mm-hmm. yeah no and i think that that's <laughs> yeah like that's where like you know our our <laughs> 10 years ago scholarship right on <laughs> know, internet it's... and society right <laughs> is like yeah like that doesn't hold anymore now that people are uh protesting with phones in their pockets and are like always yeah. online maybe the digital dualism held in you know the heyday of AOL where mm-hmm. You never would put your, you know, or at least I hope you wouldn't put your real name up and your credit card information and all this stuff. Yeah. Um because there were cyber predators out there, right? right? right. You know, and, and there's always some interesting connections. I don't know if you know this, but one of the people behind perverted justice and the groups that brought that um to catch a predator t- uh, TV show into the world. Yeah. Del mm-hmm. Harvey is in charge of Twitter's trust and safety now. Right. And so she, she was, was part, part of wow. those groups. Um, yeah, it's it's kind of interesting to think about. It's like here she she comes from this group where she's the uh, one of the people that's actually goes to the door and tells the predator to come on in mm. and uh, and spends a lot of time online prior to that trying to enroll uh, predators in this this honeypot. Um mm. And I think when I think about that connection, I I think about this notion of real world harm, which is animated by, sorry, I think that I might, yeah, no problem. And I can't figure out (laughs) now. (laughs) Sorry. Sorry. Let's just talk about uh, uh, Marshall McLuhan calls the phone like an interrupter in space and time. It demands our attention. Yeah. (laughs) Um, Anyway, I was saying that like the notion of real world harms then Mm. becomes very individualized. Mm. It becomes about individuals in their um, in their offline world being attacked or Mm. or somehow, uh, you know, like some predator gains access to them. Well, a single person being attacked by something single. So two singular agents, essentially. Right. Yeah. There's a reductionism that just doesn't work anymore. Yeah. And, and when you think about, well, what happens when you scale that interaction, when you mm. scale that, one of the things that was always like really interesting to me about To Catch a Predator is how it worked every time. Like there was never, it was <laughs> like one of the most perfect television shows in the sense that there was never going to be a lack of people to catch, which is to say that the setup conditions online matter. And when people don't think there's oversight, they don't think there's consequences. They're willing to take these major, major Mm -hmm. risks. And how I would translate that into the way the policies seem to work is that, yeah, like, unless you're out there, you know, getting arrested for um, doing hate crimes, like some of the proud boys have, have been arrested, not necessarily for hate crimes, but for, for riots, yeah. um, then we're in a different, they're put into a different category of dangerous organizations, for instance, and then action can be taken. Um, mm. But I just wonder what the service model is, if you were to think about like, 
well, what is it if you were to build these systems, not for growth and openness, but for, you know, as Twitter has said, healthy conversation or uh, more pro-social values, and you were to build in a kind of moderation that uh, didn't incentivize uh, Goodwin's law, like about, you know, how everything online is going to eventually turn into Nazism. Um, you know, like, what if, what if you, you took those things seriously and just changed the, change the way that we, we thought about platforms as a service um, that wasn't about scale? Yeah. Just before we move on from the research conversation, there's just one thing I'd love to get your thoughts on is that it feels like a lot of this research agenda emerged, I mean, obviously after 2016 and was really focused on media effects and causality, right, between, um, and maybe got distract, over, distracted by that on to what effect did manipulation have and mis- and disinformation have on an election. Do you think the the communities moved on from that? And how would you sort of assess the, that focus on mis- and disinformation now by the community? <laughs> I mean, this, uh, this line is so fraught because the people who were researchers that were uh, really pushing this idea that it's more than just social media, Okay, mm. we get it. And it's okay to say both and, right? This is the, the, the feminist methodologist in me is to say it's an ecosystem wide problem and yeah. assigning blame to any one particular industry then um, can in some ways overemphasize and release uh, other industries from any kind of culpability. And I'm thinking here about research that really tried to link. Um, Trump's victory solely to the um, the news, right? Yeah. And like Fox News in particular and echo mm. chambers and yeah. and blaming even uh, center and left media for uh, continually to cover and air Trump's lies and and just kind of making him the center of everything. Yeah. Um, and a lot of these approaches are highly quantitative and at the same time they'll say they don't have enough data they'll also say they had enough data <laughs> right, right to make these these broad claims about causality yeah yeah and i think mm -hmm. we th this happens in quantitative research all the time which is the goal of generalizability means that we don't look at the specificity uh which is where like research that i've tried to do in this space is more about well, how do we get down to that level of specificity so that we know where to look mm. in quantitative data that can help us understand more about the rationales by which people were using to make decisions about um, what, what issues were important to them and, and how to vote. Now, we know like for years of... Um, of political communication research that politics is a team sport yeah. uh, moving someone to vote for a different candidate um, is incredibly difficult which is why this year with rob ferris's research we tried to focus on primaries and tried to look at across candidates are there different ways in which misinformation disinformation as well as partisan talking points circulates and there are mm. different ways in which people who were stands for bernie use the internet than were supporters of harris um and it seems by and large supporters of biden were <laughs> right. like just just not there right <laughs> uh but biden didn't run an online campaign right and mm. he didn't need that he had uh the legacy of obama and the administration as a you know as a as a as the hook right hmm. but if we it, i think more research next time on the republican primaries will have to look at how candidates get chosen and what kinds of um information circulates online that motivates choices between like kinds hmm. uh because that to me is what's yeah, what's yeah. important here um but i also like 
voting isn't the only political uh, touch point that people have with the world. People do lots of polit- people carry out lots of political acts, big and small. Yeah. Um, and so there's definitely a lot more that this field can learn if they were to look at um, disinformation campaigns that animate people's uh sensibilities that get them to move off the couch and into the world which is why we focused a lot on looking at these reopen protests and how they brought together both militia groups with uh anti-vaxxers yeah. with uh uh it's a third thing like the QAnon crowd animated by trump supporters who thought that this was a plot to to overthrow him all of these things together I think uh, don't lead to a kind of monocausal quantitative analysis, but Mm -hmm. does get us to the point where I think everybody knows that people form communities online Mm -hmm. and it's in that bonds, it's in those bonds and in those spaces that people make decisions about, do I go to this protest or not? Do I Mm -hmm. spend $400 to take a flight to DC? Uh, to save Trump from uh, the Democrats and Republicans. Um, You know, those kinds of decisions we can look at and we can understand. I'm very excited to see Erica Chenoweth's research develop around protest momentum Mm. and um, crowd counting, because I think that we can start to get a sense of scale in other ways. Yeah. Uh, that's a long way around of saying (laughs) that, yeah, this field has been, has been, dogged by these debates about impact that are potentially really thwarting our ability to see that people do take action in the world and it's those actions that we should take seriously. Um, But that speech as well, especially when people repeat things over and over and over again, as they do online, that too is incredibly important to study and understand because I don't think, you know, this gets back to the digital duality question. I don't think people make much of a distinction between this is my online account for Patriot 2467150 and my life. And those distinctions, I think, are a relic of a field um, of data analysis and social network analysis that um would do well to look at qualitative research on the topic and get a sense of um alternative ways in which people understand and make sense of the world uh but yeah there's a preponderance and a dominance of of these um data science approaches because of the possibility that social media holds uh as as a potential wellspring i mean I've sat in meetings, I've been on panels where people will say very openly that social media is the most important data set of all time. Mm-hmm. And I think about it and I, and I think like, does anybody posting a picture of their cat and their, um, you know, their lasagna think that's going to end up in a database at Harvard yeah. and, you know, and someone's going to analyze that? Yeah. No. And so for me, like the, there's a big barrier to doing uh research in a in a massive context like that when i don't think we've even broached the con the the ethical consent models that we would need in order to do that with the duty of care that i think we owe um those who participate in it yeah exactly knowing and 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 if they don't know they're participating in it um under what under what rubric are you going to make those decisions as a researcher? You know, AOIR, the Association of Internet Researchers, has some fantastic guidelines about this. And that's how we, uh, as a research team, model our, uh, you know, our, our methodologies. Yeah. I mean, I, I talked to Cory Doctorow last month who makes a similar point here that fetishizing the power of those data sets also feeds into the very claim platforms are making to advertisers, which is mm-hmm. this data is all powerful, right? And yeah. therefore our tools can manipulate people to do anything you want them to do, 
right? So in some yeah. ways we're playing into that mythology. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think that that's also interesting in terms of like conversion, right? Which is what happens when someone sees an ad for a hamburger and then goes and gets a hamburger. Mm. Um, you know, like for me, I'm trying to think about like how that translates in the research world where people then think, oh, because someone was posting about something, mm. they must therefore have some kind of ardent, you know, belief in it. And when we start to scratch the surface, like with Alice Marwick's work about fake news, Sometimes, you know, people know it's false, they're trolling. Yeah. And the mm. way that you get at that context isn't by abstracting the data from or lifting it from where it is, you know, when then creating a hyperlink map and saying this many mm. people thought X, you know, because yeah. they shared this. But know, it was never about that binary truth. It was, exactly, yeah. exactly. And so yeah. like, that's why we have to get much more in situ and then also think through the like, implications of that but it is it's hard to say you know because um i'm sure like you know i i've uh i've heard through the grapevine uh that some of the criticism of the more tech-centric research centers uh about my own research is that i'm a non-technical person and the evidence of that is that i've uh got a degree in sociology and i complain about <laughs> data in the way that I do. Uh, but I am surrounded by some of the most forward thinking technologists, methodologists Absolutely. that um, think a lot about the work, which is, you know, when you do research, the data gathering process has also been obfuscated by package data sets from platform companies by APIs. There was a great conference Amelia Acker and I went to um, called Locked Out of Platforms, and there's an excellent special issue of it. Mm -hmm. um, and the idea here is is pretty simple, which is to say that the API shapes, uh, if you're using it, shapes the analysis by virtue of shaping the data gathering process. Mm -hmm. So we've been working a lot with Media Cloud and and uh, you know Ethan Zuckerman and Yokai and. Uh, you know, Kai Binkler and Rob Ferris have yeah. like, you know, really made that tool something that works one independently of um, platform level data Two, it's reliable in the sense that you get the same data every time, which I mm. can't say about CrowdTangle and other places. Yeah. Um, and then uh, when when you're using it, uh, you kind of know what you get. And so mm. and you know that it's not uh, beholden to uh, any corporate logic. Yeah. You know, and the overarching part of this conversation, of course, is just the <laughs> the evisceration of the field of independent research on AI that's happening right now, where uh, the um, the firing of uh, Dr. Timnick Gabro, yeah. like this. This move in Google has then led to other kinds of leaks of documents saying that Google's reviewing research and, and asking for a positive spin. Yeah. Uh, as well, Amelia Acker was, we were discussing the crowd computing credits and how, you know, these big data uh, operations are, are also getting lots and lots of cloud credits that are not being well documented in the public around conflict of interest. Mm. Um, and the list goes on, and especially in AI, for how the innovation in that space is com is completely beholden to uh, corporate logics about what counts as research. And, mm. um, you know, and so we don't, I don't want this field of disinformation studies to go the way of big tobacco research or or um, AI research, or even pharmaceutical research, like, hmm. you know, and that reckoning will come because eventually someone in one of these corporations is going to get mad enough to say, this is what was going on the whole time. Yeah. And, um, and our field has to be cognizant of those relationships and of that history so that we can make appropriate decisions about stewardship and independence yeah. Um, Look, but unfortunately, we're so far away from, I mean, <laughs> I hate to say it, yeah, like, you think so? even, well, I don't know. I mean, even the debate, I don't want to get down too far this rabbit hole, but like even the debate about whether to take funding from platforms mm -hmm. feels like it's still on the surface, right? Like we're like, 
oh, it's yeah, still at no. that and, level, and this, right? Let know, alone though, access and entanglement, all these other things that we know are occurring or seem to be mm -hmm. pretty buried no. here at the moment. No, it does. And if you think too about the way in which um, different uh, initiatives, funding initiatives from Google around news, right? As we were talking about the the growing oh, fake yeah. news ecosystem, local the death of local news, you get these band aids that are like, oh, we'll do three hundred million, and it sounds like a lot. And then you look at well, distributed across how many places for how long of time, and then. What does that mean if you do cover uh, this company um, uh, critically oh, yeah. in any way, you know, and, and it, but it goes back to, if you look at how they're designed to siphon up so much of the money that would be uh, a kind of littered across a distributed information ecosystem, it's the scale that has really enabled them to to soak up so much of the data and the um and the advertising revenue and so there's there's a lot of points of contact with policy yeah. that need to be made in order to um bring that out but you know i just had a an op-ed come out um in uh slate about the the use of facial recognition technology by disinformation slash uh, computer scientist researchers to identify uh, people at the Capitol, right? right? So, like, I mean, you know, one of them at the Citizen Lab, and yeah, Korea. and I, yeah. you know, I, I like, I, you know, I, I revere the work that comes out of there. I read it, um, yeah, the, like, on the minute, but at the same time, like that technology, our our co researchers in this world have said it's not worth the 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 like the way in which it will be marketed after your use it's not worth the using it because it's bad for everyone yeah. and so uh uh yeah but getting the field to fall in line at the same time as like trying to support researchers who do critical work uh that's that's you know been my main thing since i was uh you know kind of coming up in this game is like i want to protect those researchers who are doing mm. the work that is critical and is informed and and i you know if whatever kind of flack i can take for them mm. uh so that you know they're supported that is important yeah but at the same time we do need uh you know we do as a field and at least in disinformation need to come together and realize that the use of the platform data the use of some of these uh nefarious technologies and databases um ultimately like that's going to be our legacy uh yeah. and so we don't want to we don't want to keep making the same mistakes over and over and over again yeah one of the interesting things I thought in the last two days has been this international leader response to the to the Trump Twitter bans. And I think so Merkel and a bunch of French politicians and pushing back against it. And I think that's being interpreted as them taking the sides of platforms and sort of the sort of more free speech absolutist perspective. But I actually think it's something very different. It's them saying this is the result of these companies being ungoverned or being being left undergoverned. And they're calling for more, right? They're calling for more govern governance and government, which is I don't think how it's being interpreted in, in mm -hmm. the US right now, for example. Um, I'm wondering how you think our policy conversation needs to change in a way that it can get at structure and get at some of these complexities of the way the network functions and of the actors in it and of the design of the system, all the thing we, things we know to be true. How can the policy agenda adapt to that? Because it's not there now, I don't think. I mean, it's a, it's a good question. You know, I... I'm inclined not to believe that these companies really want legislation, right? Yeah, I'm inclined to believe that there's a move happening where on the one hand, they'll say, 
in a very chaotic moment, you know, do whatever you got to do. Like we're over here, like go legislate. And then in the background of all of that, they're employing teams in DC and other people to move the needle away from business models, away from oversight, away from oversight and to offload the responsibility onto uh, either other professions like the whole fact checking world in which they have contracts and subcontracts with fact checking agencies that they then um, assign, you know, uh, stories to, and then they go and they fact check them and then they come yeah. back and those fact checks are applied to in labels. Um, but even within those networks, when you talk to the fact checkers and the organizations, it's been a huge boon to the industry, but they get paid per article. It's very piecemeal. Yeah. And they never know when something like this is going to happen, which is that you might be uh, told that you're going to get paid for 3000 fact checks in a month. And by, you know, day four of the month, you're like pretty close to having finished all of them because <laughs> it was so wild, right? It yeah. was so too much. Yeah, yeah. Uh, or there was a cascade of different, um, you know, um, disinformation. So the, the offloading of responsibility onto other professional sectors is something that I talk about as a, as a true cost of misinformation, which is to yeah. say that we could actually figure out what the costs are to journalism that has to pick up the slack. The other part that I'm inclined to think about when they say, yes, we want this, but no, not that way, is to look at the openness of the advertising systems and how they're used adversarially hmm. and how we've seen the weaponization of these advertising systems and uh, when they do uh, roll back uh, people using them, we get different kinds of effects than when uh, their advertising systems are fully open to political operatives. And so the markup has some really great research uh, about this using their citizen browser project where they were able to say, you know, that um, the moment that they, that Facebook reopened the pathway for political advertising, there was an attack on Warnock uh, in Georgia around a cheap fake campaign, which is basically yeah. uh, a very short clip of him saying God damn America from 2013, where he was quoting mm. someone else. Yeah. So, um, so that is to say that I think the, the scale needs to be the target of the policy as well as the, the business model uh, around openness that yeah. uh, produces so many of these ill effects. Um, and the fact of the matter is, is that when these companies say uh, we, we welcome regulation, they mean of a certain kind and type and one that specifically doesn't require them to either break up their businesses or, uh, you know, uh, create limits for the kinds of profit that they take yeah. in or profit sharing uh, downstream. I mean, Facebook's uh, campaign which is advertised everywhere now in newspapers, online, on all the main political newsletters, mm -hmm. calling for regulation is, is very clearly more effort going into it being a PR campaign than, than meaningful, meaningful reform. And you, you consistently hear, well, we want smart regulations or we mm -hmm. want, right? Like there's, there's this frame of, of uh, how regulations should be discussed that I find just very off-putting. Yeah, but that's that's a move, right? If you offload responsibility and say, well, these politicians wouldn't do it either. Uh, you oh, know, yeah. like we tried, like we were just doing we've our been thing. Asking, and and then, we've been asking for it. So we've been, we've been begging. Yeah. yeah. I've been begging for you to clean the dishes. <laughs> you won't do it. <laughs> Right. And dish is still dirty. Though. And you blame me for breaking the plate. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Right. Um, which is why, like, you know, I'm just, you know, I'm just a lonely researcher over here, all over in my silo, unable to see beyond, you know, the, my own self-interest. Yeah. Right. But I do know one thing, which is that all of the evidence is there that these companies are trying to blame everybody else for the design like it's actually a design problem 
Um, you know, one of the things that was interesting, if you look at kinds of research that becomes uh, talked about in platform companies, there was this paper that Camille Francois did. It's a beautiful paper, ABC model of, you know, looking at misinformation, actors, behavior, content. Mm. And as I was talking with people in platform companies about how they apply this model, I'm like, but what about D, design? And they're like, well, you know, I hear you, but fish, 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 water. <laughs> right? How do you describe the water? And I'm like, the water's everything. The fish don't live without the, the water, water, right? The water's but you. <laughs> the water is, you know, but that kind of talk yeah. permeates these groups, which is to say that even internally, the policy folks don't have a clear enough vision of how the design works in order to think through decisions mm -hmm. and design that would then change how policy operated. Yeah. Latanya Sweeney, uh, drawing from Harbor Moss and others around technological determinism, like looks at this as a kind of technocracy problem, which is that the technology creates the policy, yeah. not the other way around. Right. Yeah. And so if you look at the technology and then the policy that springs forth from it, like the idea that you would change the technology just seems bananas. Right. You know, in, in comparison to changing all the things around it. Uh, which feel uh, much more achievable, uh, given the the like bulkiness and the and you know the other thing is we, like you imagine technology to be like fast and flexible and responsive, but it's really not when you layer on so much bureaucracy as well as um, mm. uh, uh, a CEO model that has more of a charismatic figurehead. Yeah. uh model than it does uh pro programmatic approach mm. you end up in this kind of mess where like i mean like i make this joke a lot but it's still funny to me which is you know zuckerberg and dorsey are the highest paid content moderators on the planet thanks to <laughs> trump right i mean well, like and, can and you imagine? where was dorsey he was in like the polynesian island wasn't he making that decision yeah might too? as well like I mean, yeah get bad. him out of his like <laughs> sleep chamber and uh <laughs> you know and like and like get him to get him to comb that beard and then yeah. you know get him to read some of these trump tweets and make some decisions on well does a kid stay up does it get a label does it get this does it get that yeah. it's um, a bit different it's a bit easier than uh, talking about the very incentive structure of a yeah but none of it is hey to millions of users right yeah um, would you rather yeah. have four jets and own an island uh or like not have the the entire world angry with you about your inability to rein yeah. in your technology um yeah. and apply your own policies to to people who are um using it to overthrow the U.S. government. I mean, the whole thing sounds like a Will Smith movie, right? <laughs> like I, like I do, I, it, the, you know, if this movie were to be made today, it would be like, well, he seemed like, you know, uh, uh, like he seemed a little off, but mm. you know, charis, you know, he's charismatic and, you know, he's on the apprentice. So, I mean, how, how much, yeah. how, how dangerous could he be? And, um, yeah. And we end up in these situations because I think we don't, we don't believe the words that are coming out of our own mouths. Like we don't believe yeah. what we see, um, you know, and I think that that's also a trick of disinformation, which is that, um, you know, I talked to reporters in this field, especially around medical misinformation. And as we like witness the rollout of the vaccines and all of the different really kooky things that are being said about the vaccine around nanotechnology mm. and it yeah. harboring microchips and then it yeah. like, you know, making, um, you know, women infertile, et cetera. Like you think about it, all of these, these things. And then you, as a researcher, you step back, you look at the science and you say, well, there are a lot of things we don't know. Mm. And that's where we have to divide the line between the research and the like personal imp impulse to want to do better in this world is that you don't want to be caught, um, as one reporter said to me, you don't want to be caught carrying water for these uh, pharmaceutical companies either because they don't have a great track record mm. of uh, respecting, you know, public autonomy and, and the scientific process either. Mm. Uh, they benefit from pushing this through. Uh, but at the same time, we know it's not, you know, Bill Gates, 
like putting microchips <laughs> in them and like yeah. marking us with, with alien <laughs> tattoos so that, you know, the, so that we have the mark of the beast. And when Jesus finally comes back, he's going to be able to see the ones that were vaccinated and the ones that weren't. And yeah. the ones that weren't are going to heaven and everybody else is going to be made Satan's slave. And so you have to stop me, Taylor. I will yeah. keep going. Okay. Stop, 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 <laughs> stop, stop, stop. Okay. Stop. One last question for you. Yeah. One last question. Okay. Um, in a, in a, you testified to Congress recently and I'll, we'll link to the, to the video of it. Cause it's, I thought it was pretty remarkable. Um, but you ended by saying, what would it mean to uninvent social media? What did yeah. you mean by that? And what are the stakes in that? Cause. So I'm a big, big fan of Donald McKenzie and the STS scholarship on, um, uninventing the bomb, right? Mm. This idea that we brought a technology into this world that means we can end this world right that's what this that's what the bomb means is every mm -hmm. like the biggest bomb means everybody dies the mother of all bombs mm -hmm. um and so i think a lot about the social shaping of tech and this idea that uh we don't really often think about how to roll back innovation we don't think about how to uninvent things we don't have an imagination for a future without something that has been poorly designed and threatens our um, entire existence. And in the case of war technologies, of course, it's a little bit clearer where we go, which is to say that we have uh, uh, auditing systems, we have negotiations, there's peace treaties, there's yeah. all kinds of ways, like an immense amount of uh, hand wringing and bureaucracy that is applied to nuclear weapons technologies um, across the globe because this technology exists now mm. uh, and and was brought into this world and and that it is so dire and so terrible that um, again in the wrong hands could cause massive massive pain. And so when I think about how do you uninvent social media, it's, it's thinking with that lens, thinking with those ideas, how do we approach regulation uh, and prioritize those who are going to be harmed, killed by unbridled uh, social media, open and working at scale and mm. You don't get that without someone like Trump, of course. Trump is an important feature of the system in that sense that he is a person that is installed in power, has access to militaries. Trump's big failure, I think, was actually back when he did that photo op and cleared Washington, D.C. protesters out by force. If he hadn't done that, he probably wouldn't have lost the trust of the military and the army. Mm. I mean, they probably still would have given him, gave him some side eye mm. and maybe weren't, wouldn't be enrolled uh, at the level that some Republican representatives have been enrolled mm. um, in a scheme to overthrow the election. But uh, nevertheless, successful coups often are because someone has figured out how to make all of these things work in alignment, including a public that welcomes the change, hmm. a pub, like at least a, a part of the public that welcomes the, the overthrow. And I'm thinking here in particular about um, the overthrow of, of uh, uh, Morsi in Egypt, uh, hmm. you know, where the, you, you end up in this position um, because you don't imagine a world without the technology hmm. as it is designed. Yeah. And, and as it is today, importantly, right? Because yeah, exactly. These, these are and, constantly and like, evolving, but we always take the current moment as the baseline. Exactly, exactly. And the current yeah. moment right now is that we finally have seen the um, the important impacts of openness and scale on the public, which is to say that you know looking back, Charlottesville looks like uh, a precursor and ominous warning. Uh, if you don't do something now, 
Mm. something worse will come kind of moment only because um, the future has to happen, Mm. right? It has to play out. And for every person that could have made a decision and didn't or tried to make a decision and uh, was thwarted, those that kind of an action is so important for us to mm. understand sociologically as the rationale by which we will then get into another situation like this when these groups figure out how to remount an attack with newer and bigger consequences. Yeah. On that note of optimism... No, I mean, optimism. I got cats. I got memes. Like, I got all kinds of things keep me optimistic. But, you know, but not not politics. That was my conversation with Joan Donovan. As always, I'd love to hear from you. You can reach me at taylor at bigtechpodcast.com. Big Tech is presented by the Center for International Governance Innovation and produced by Antica Productions. Please consider subscribing on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. We release new episodes on Thursdays every other week.